Copy any more introduction, maybe, but I will officiate a brief one anyway uh, by saying that uh, there could not be a more uh, appropriate uh, initial keynote speaker uh, when the conference is called Semiosis and Communication. He was professor in semiotics and communication in the London Metropolitan University, then he now uh, holds a professorship in Middlesex University. In, uh, language and media. He has several books uh, in topics related to narrative, uh, uh, communication, um, also uh, narrative related topics. Uh, also, John Dealey and, and Thomas Siebel is part of his uh, topics in books and very prolific editorial activity. And as you know, president of the International Association of Semiotic Studies. What else? Uh, now he's going to talk to us uh, about um, why the semiotics and the analytic technique called crossbreeding uh, belongs to the center of humanities. Many thanks. I'm delighted to um, to receive a tribute from my. Uh, close to colleague Louis Bruni, um, so thanks for that. I want to speak about close reading. And, you know, th this is a term that, that has a sort of popular and, you know, more, more demotic side to it than uh, a technical side. When I was last year, I, was, I spoke about code. And similarly, code has like, a demotic uh, aspect as well. Um, so I shall confess at the outset that really I consider a lot of the work that we do in semiotics to be a kind of like close reading. But my presentation, I think, ultimately will conclude that um, we need to be a bit more nuanced about what we mean by close readings. People have much, well, very diverse. Uh, understandings of what it is, and you, you will see that because I'll, I'll present a, a little bit of pilot research, uh, and I'll, I'll go through those slides very quickly. Pilot research, so I, it may test your patience, but uh, hopefully I will have something to say uh, about this issue beyond but showing you a number of our jobs. So I want to start off by asking for a show of hands: How many people know? Who this gentleman is or was. Okay, so a few, few people know who uh, I.A. Richards was. And I'm really glad because, you know, at least there will be some interest for some of the other people to actually find out who this guy was, even if there's no interest in the rest of the paper. Um, but I, I uh, invoked I.A. Richards for a specific reason. If you think about it, the whole idea of close reading is an old one, okay? You point to scriptural exegesis, for example. That, that's, that's close reading, that's close reading on excellence. Or if we think about um, our tradition, the semiotic tradition, the close reading of symptoms, we go all the way back to Hippocrates. Okay, so, so close reading in that sense is absolutely nothing new. In semiotics, you know, we've established the principles that have been adopted on demotic side by so many, uh, um, so many people who are engaged in close reading through the notion of the text, okay, which was invented in the 1960s almost simultaneously by uh, Roland Barthes, pictured here, okay, and, uh, and Yuri Lockman. Okay, and from that, we know the idea of textual analysis. And above all, I would point to the work of, uh, of the Italian semiotician lost to us a couple of years ago, uh, who worked, worked especially on close reading to establish the limits of interpretation, the name of the book that he wrote, and uh, a famous uh, essay, sorry, the limits of interpretation was an essay in a book called uh, Interpretation and Overinterpretation. Um, and also, if you look at his career, uh, the limits of code. So he's, he's doing work which is absolutely central to what I see um, uh, semiotics to be, and also like close reading in, in this presentation. But you could say 
But the idea, of course, really, particularly as it's institutionalized in universities, it was invented almost 90 years ago by this guy, I.A. Richards, I.B. Armstrong Richards, particularly in um, these books, uh, Principles of Literary Criticism, which was a general uh, volume that he published in 1936, and then a more experimental and uh, research-based volume called um, uh, Practice of Criticism in 1929. And some of you may know Richards from um, The Meaning of Meaning, which he co-authored with, uh, with Ogden, I think, in 1923. Um, I'm sorry, I, I have to apologize that all I've shown so far is pictures of men. <laughs> right? So white, middle-class men, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Um, and you know, when I was at university, so I was taught by this guy, John Whitley. He, he didn't publish much, so you wouldn't know about it. But it was in the 1980s, and of course, whenever you went to a, a seminar, you had to mention Derrida if you were in humanities, you know, to try to annoy the tutor. And I, I did this a few times, and this guy, John Whitley, said, well, I don't worry about Derrida, he said, because I have a link to um, I.A. Richards. Okay, and he said, I was taught by William Emerson, okay, seven types of ambiguity, and William Emerson was taught by I.A. Richards, and I.A. Richards was streets ahead of, uh, of Derrida, uh, and so he didn't say this, but effectively you say, I am streets ahead of Derrida. Um, now, I can now demonstrate a similar link to I.A. Richards, but even further back, because for those people who were upset at seeing all these men, as you know, Whenever there is a good man, there's always a better woman behind them. Okay, so, well, there's me, there's Whitley, there's Emerson, there's, there's Richards, who was taught by Ogden, and all of them were taught by Lady Welby. Okay, so, Close reading, effectively, we get from. I mean, ultimately, we get okay, from Lady Welby. We have two Welby specialists in the audience today, and I won't embarrass them by, by saying who they are. So, but if you sit them out during this conference, you will be rewarded. Okay, so um, Richards was a, a proto semiotician, and in practical criticism, which is this uh, volume that I'm going to describe in a minute, you can see that quite clearly. The reason I mention it is it's quite interesting to find out that this proto semiotician referring to the uh, his works. But the other thing is that I think that, that uh, Richards is in some ways caught in a dilemma that we are caught in and as semioticians, but also the people who are um, promulgating close reading techniques, as you will see from the research I've carried out. Uh, let me see if I can read this quote. Oh, we bring it up the screen. Uh, okay, he says, from the point of view of this attained, what would expect that our libraries would be full of works on the theory of interpretation, the diagnosis of linguistic situations, systematic ambiguity, and the functions of complex symbols. And then there would be chairs of significance or of general linguistics at all our universities. He's writing this in 1929. Yet, in point of fact, there's no respectable treatise on the theory of linguistic interpretation in existence. And no person whose professional occupation it is to inquire into these questions and direct study in the matter. But grammatical studies do not trespass upon this topic. Surely, systematic investigation of the uses of language may be expected to improve our actual daily use of it, at least in the same measure that the study of plant physiology, physiology may improve agriculture or human physiology assist medicine or hygiene. There is no other human activity for which theory bears so small a proportion to practice. Even the theory of football has been more thoroughly inquired into. Well, there, there are at least a few of us I know who would be, although committed semioticians, would be more interested in, in those inquiries into, uh, into football. Um, but remember, this is 1929 that he's writing this. Okay. So I'm effectively saying that he, he invented this, this idea that's been institutionalized of, uh, of close 
reading, and he did it in this book, which featured a series of experiments on uh, undergraduates. What he did was he gave them poems, okay, and poetry is quite important to this, uh, this discussion for reasons which I hope will unfold. He, he gave uh, a series of unattributed poems to the students and said, you know, can you comment on them? And can you say what your engagement is? And so forth. Um, and effectively, he was trying to elicit some kind of interpretation and aesthetic uh, response. Um, but what I would argue, although he never develops it in the ways which we would consider appropriate to the contemporary situation, he's also engaged in an exercise in communication and cognition ability. If you think he has this very heavy stress on communication, you know, like this, uh, this conference does, stress on communication, which would have been quite unusual in the 1920s in the Western capital. Okay, so that, that was um, uh, Richard's work, the experiment that he carried out. I'll say a little bit more about that as we go along. But last year, kind of, you know, in tribute to, to Richard's, I and a colleague carried out a survey, not of students, but now of teachers in uh, UK in higher education in the first instance. Okay, so, some others entered into that equation, so we have to put some of the uh, responses out. And we wanted to find out broadly through survey methods using portraits um, how, how individual teachers would implement and, uh, and see their role in uh, engaging students in Okay, so the first some of the coordinates that we've got, uh, uh, we had about 146 responses. We, we only expected to get about 40, in fact, but people were, were quite engaged in this. Eventually, we, we reduced them down to 61. That will be what, what's represented here. There was a, a, a slight discrepancy between uh, male and uh, female, as you can see. Most of them were quite experienced teachers, you know, an average of 16 to, to 17 years. Uh, and the range of teaching uh, already started to, from people who had about like, three years' worth of teaching uh, up to 37 years of teaching. The results are, are skewed by uh, the sampling which was done through targeting uh, specific kinds of professional mailing lists to media, cultural studies, linguistics, uh, some political science, some communications, uh, etc. Okay, so I will take you through through very quickly the, the risk of, um, of training your patients before I get onto a bit of theoretical meat, um, which hopefully won't be too tactical, but I, I'll take you through the, the, uh, the results, which are reasonably approachable, but do feel free to stop me if I'm going too fast. So I've done it all in bar charts, you know, you do back quickly, so it's on the portraits to make it uh, absolutely clear. But if you can see from our first question, or our, our, our brief, we deliberately took a, what I would call a semiotic perspective in the sense that we weren't just looking at literary texts or written texts or whatever, we, we tried to, to have the broad panoply of, uh, of, of semiotic texts, you know, texts that had visual components, texts of different kinds with no um, hierarchical values associated with them. So that's uh, the opening statement. Uh, the first part of the, uh, the, the survey is quantitative and it's based on a number of scalar uh, questions, one to seven. You're probably familiar with this, where well, one is not all important in the answer and seven is very important in the answer. Okay, so I mean, this is the kind of thing that, um, that any respondent would have identified, sorry, would have been confronted with when they uh, logged on to, to do this survey as well it is. Okay, so let's have a look at, uh, at some of the, the results. Um, there was a slight mistake with this uh, with this setting up of Qualtrics for the uh, for the survey, and so uh, you can see that the predominance of the teachers is uh, undergraduate. But really, there should have been an opportunity to say undergraduate and postgraduate. Okay, so those, those figures are, uh, are quite skewed, but it's, it's kind of nice because Richardson was, uh, sorry, Richards was dealing with uh, undergraduates. 
We asked about edu educational goals in employing post regional techniques. Okay, so this one in particular uh, is about the ability to understand numbers and quant uh, quantitative uh, relationships. You know, this is that why you teach uh, post regional. And surprisingly, you know, there's a few people who are saying that they do not. Okay, but as you can see, most of them are skewed towards the bottom end. Sorry about this. The, the graphs and the bar charts, if they come from Qualtrics and they're just this colour, I, I could have worked on them to make them a, uh, make them a different colour, but um, I, know, I decided to have breakfast this morning instead. <laughs> okay, so I'm still on educational goals. This one is about uh, ability to carefully and thoughtfully read and interpret text. You can see down that end is where the, um, uh, where the bulk of the responses are going. Okay, similar pictures with uh, with these other questions. You know, teaching students to express themselves freely. Okay, so I mean, these questions are a bit a bit skewed. You know, they they can only answer the, the questions that are put to them. But there are some open-ended ones as well. And you, you'll see actually that the open-ended ones and the black bar after ones that are given in the quantitative section. This one is about. The goal of uh, promoting self-assuredness in in presenting to other people, standing up and presenting in, in this way, for example, you know, just goes through in the back there. And you can see the, the results generally is skewed to one end, uh, while well, the big one is often, you know, the, the one that come from that is like always. And then there are some questions about the teacher's contribution. How can the teacher uh, ensure that uh, the close reading meets its educational goals. Okay, so this one is, uh, you know, how can you make sure through close reading that there's uh, the ability to express yourself clearly? Once again, extreme confidence in the ability to do this. Um, finding information. Okay, again, always extreme confidence uh, in this. Um, Self-assuredness in presenting to other people is simply variegational. You can see that it's not skewed to that far end as much. And then we have a set of questions, I'm summarizing, but uh, we had questions about purposes. You know, what is the, uh, the role? Is it, is it often this or is it often something else? And it's a scale of uh, one, two, three, four, where never is one and four is always. Okay, so. Uh, what objectives do you have in mind when encouraging your students to make close reading? Uh, learning for an exam. Okay, so very few people are involved in getting students to do close reading as, a, as part of an examination process. Okay, so we assume that it's mostly a coursework thing. Uh, stylistic analysis. Quite a few people seem to know about stylistic analysis. Okay, so that they were, were thinking about issues of, of style, you know, the personal production mode of, uh, of any text that in the first reading. Okay, then this is the, this one on um, on fostering a sense of creative process. It's a, a, an extension of the last one, but a lot of the work that we do, if you work in institutions like this and in uh, institutions like mine, you are teaching students through examining extant texts to get a sense of how those texts were produced. Okay, and that's borne out by the results here. It's mainly often, but there are some there that are uh, responding to always. Uh, and this one is about, uh, about nuance, okay, about, uh, about more, um, more sophisticated forms of of analysis and seeing in, uh, in close reading. And it seems that that's pretty clear because it's, uh, it's almost everybody that, uh, that believes that that's one of the most important reading techniques. Um, this one is about personal response. There's always going to be this issue in, uh, in semiotics, especially about 
the extent to which meanings are, are objective and you're trying to teach your objective meanings, or whether you are trying to get to that through a personal response to the text, or whether personal response is an end in itself. Um, so we didn't ask the more nuanced of those questions, but you can see that uh, the personal response ranks quite high. Yeah. And then some questions about situations for post reading. Okay, and um, again, this one is, is about um, about places where you encourage people to do it, whether it's in class or whether it's in assessments. And clearly, it's taking place across both areas. Okay, so sometimes it's being used as a, a, a mode of assessment, either orally or in the Okay, and uh, this one is about. That one was about. This one is about coursework. That one was about. Yeah, that one was about uh, long text and short text. I'm wearing my glasses. So I <laughs> okay, so so the use of proposed proposed uh, levels of text. Uh, and then this one's about, uh, about assessment, whether they're using for, um, not just in class, or whether they're using for actually assessing students. This one is about written reports and spoken reports. You can see, once again, it's skewed to both on the far right. <coughs> and then eventually I should say something about findings. Now, in the sample of 61, this is only ever going to be a pilot. I mean, what we wish to do is to expand the research to the entirety of, of Europe or to ever response to a survey uh, across Europe. So we can't really say that much about the prevalence of close reading. But um, I've put together a list um, of the areas where people came from. We asked them to, to confess where they came from. And you can see that it's reasonably varied. It's all the, the humanities because we didn't target uh, any of the sciences. But you, you can see that it's not just literary people who are consider, considering that post reading is important. It's not just people who have that unitary sense of text. But it's also people from theatre, there's people from film, uh, some political science, some linguistics, partly to do with the, the lists, the professional scholarly lists that we targeted. But uh, I think it does, in a preliminary way, demonstrate that there is a spread of the practice of post reading. In terms of um, educational goals, there's a, another big list that I've, um, I've given Dina. Um, but when I come to draw this paper to a conclusion, you know, we will see that a lot of these goals are actually very similar, and they haven't changed very much since 1929. I don't think there, is, there are some conceptions there that are enriched, not just about post reading, but also about the, the role of post reading in the community that can't really change, okay, possibly for, for reasons to do with the very term those really. And then um, there was a question about how much do you think you can contribute in close reading to the development of students. <coughs> and we also uh, offered them an opportunity to say, is there anything extra that we haven't mentioned that you could contribute? And these were the things that, that they said, which are of a piece, I would say, once more, with some of the abilities that we just mentioned, and also with some of Richard's, uh, Richard's findings in 1929. So, um, enabling the students to learn about contemporary debates, enabling the students to engage in debates, uh, enthusiasm and passion, okay? Uh, independent learning, being able to go away and um, work with the text, Working with different kinds of texts, intertextual exegesis. Learning about perseverance and hard work. Okay? Learning about qualitative relationships and analysis. And then simply said, learning to write well, which I'm not going to write well and stuff. Do you use close reading in your educational practice? So this is drawing me towards some conclusions because I'm very much summarizing here what people said, and I'm particularly summarizing the last few slides, uh, sorry, the last few slides. But what I'm finding is that the respondents, perhaps because of the way the survey was constructed, but it can't just be this. 
The respondents are stressing analysis, the stress of stressing the systematic approach that goes reading uh, involves the stressing critical thinking and rigor, uh, the stressing analysis of rhetoric and persuasion, um, engagement, aesthetic engagement as well, uh, and some uh, responses as you might have guessed to that issue that I mentioned before about learning <coughs> tends to produce, okay, so learning about uh, production. The slightly less which is surprising for me, on feelings, on desires, on passion. You know, perhaps that's all conflated with personal response. Um, and slightly less on context, and the you know, context was certainly something that, that Richard sort of downgraded. He wanted more of a, an engagement with the communication aspects of individual texts. And then there's this. I don't know if you remember, for those of you who were here last time, I gave this paper on code. And code historically has many determinants for semiotics, but one of them is magic. You know, divination is an early form of, you know, a pre Socratic form of semiotics. And somebody actually said this is a quote the close reading is a mode of divination in a literal sense. Which I thought was, you know, just wacky, uh, but understandable in the context. Some are very much in the wake of Richards. Okay, I couldn't give you all of these longer statements, but I, I just picked out a, a few, uh, and they're illustrative for me because they demonstrate the relationship between close reading and the endeavour of the humanities in general. So I'll read these out to you. I think it's finally important to take the time to consider how texts come to mean something to those who read, watch, consume, or listen to them. Close reading can only ever tell us part of the story, along with other contextual factors such as habitus or reception practices, but can be a really useful way of determining what a text might be trying to convey. I don't think it's anywhere near as objective as many other scholars in my field, the film students assume it to be. I absolutely believe that all of society would benefit if they took time to be critical of meaning and where it comes from, rather than making snap judgments based on nothing more than instinct and blind prejudice. It could almost be Richards speaking in the 1920s. Um, two, it's a different um, statement. I want my students to learn how to identify an author's position. Distinguish that from the evidence the author uses and the other positions the author refutes. I want students to acquire the ability to discuss how an argument is waged or how it proceeds. In the end, these skills should help them to evaluate the merit and validity of an argument for a particular position. These skills are applicable across disciplines and outside of the academy. Higher literacy is probably the most important enabler for personal economic stability, in addition to the intrinsic pleasures it supports relative to a rich cultural life. Again, you know, not quite, uh, which is a slight emphasis on authorial intention, which, you know, which is trying to evacuate. And that, for those of you who know uh, the history of literary theory in the 20th century, that eventually evolved into what was called the new criticism in the United States. Um, but I think interesting that for someone like me who has been looking at discourse to support the humanities over the last few years, these are very much liberal arguments. You know, part of, of Richards is very much a, a, a liberal argument. And those liberal arguments are very much in circulation today and they're evident in segments like this. And then um, uh, finally, a more interdisciplinary uh, idea. It provides access to knowledge in every discipline. It provides access to deep knowledge that surface reading might not be. Okay, I, I, I've got to say, I, I do have sympathy with these, and I go along with these responses. I wouldn't criticize anyone for this, but they do seem to be redolent of the kind of liberalism that's involved with defending the humanities against its um, onslaught by governments uh, in the West at the moment. There is this idea, quite commonly abroad, and it's stated in this, uh, this quote, 
that the relationship with the humanities and um, the, uh, the practice of course reading is very, very close. As an approach to thinking processes, a commitment to close reading may be the nearest thing to a shared principle of contemporary criticism. Okay, so that there is some sharing, and certainly our survey bears out that there is some sharing of uh, principles in that respect. But what about the people who dissented? Because there were some people who took the, the survey and dissented. Okay, I picked out just two because they're interested and they bear a little bit on my conclusions. Somebody said that they don't do close reading, well, certainly not very often because I think it's the weakest possible form of textual analysis. Close reading is a last resort strategy, the kind of thing one does when no more systematic approaches are available. I think undergraduates rarely have the epistemological reflexivity to be able to meaningfully determine when a close reading strategy is appropriate. Okay, so this, this is a kind of nuanced response, assuming that there are different kinds of close reading and there are some that are far more systematic and thinking things like, I don't know, critical discourse analysis, uh, conversation analysis, things like, like this that have got um, very technical paraphernalia. So I mean, that, that's uh, more criticism, but of course reading is it's, it's too intuitive, it's too, it's too personal. The other one, which I, I think says something to it kind of feels a bit snobby to me, but it says something to people who work in institutions like I work in, and it says, we read all texts, which is to say that the people who are doing close reading, like semioticians, they take a part of the text, right, and, and they use that, they extrapolate from that as somehow exemplary of the text as a whole. But not us, we read all texts. Okay. And I can understand that. In the UK, it's associated with what I would call breeding. Okay, yeah, and that is that you will know how to read text because you've been brought up in a household with lots of books, you've been brought up, up in a household with all the paraphernalia of, um, of uh, bourgeois approaches to the arts and the humanities, uh, but you will be privileged in that respect. And you know, you will know the, the, the classics quite well because you were hearing them even when you were in the cradle. Okay? I teach mainly students who didn't hear the classics and they need to interact with the, uh, the contemporary world. I'm not suggesting that they should ignore the classics, but we need to give them an entree as soon as possible to be able to analyse in a way that those people have got extreme expertise from exposure over like 20 years before they go to university. Okay, so I think that that's, uh, that's quite interesting. Just, just one thing I want to put towards a conclusion in your head. In um, 1926, when he wrote Principles of Literary Criticism, page one, Richard says that a book is a machine to think with. Okay, immediately when you read that, if you have read a or first, you reminded of Aiko, he said this on a number of occasions, that every text, after all, is a lazy machine, asking a reader to do some of its work. What a problem it would be if a text were to say everything the receiver is to understand. You would never end. Okay, so, let me draw to my last two slides, then, um, some conclusions that, that uh, I'm drawing, and it's partly because me and the guy that I'm working with, with on this project, we have a particular take on the role of, well, we hope it's a contemporary take on the role of close reading the educational settings. Yeah, and I, I, he's not a semi I should, should confess that. Um, Richardson in the 20th century is part of what I would call a movement towards a synchronic perspective. Okay, he joins with a number of, of people who are very much uh, concerned with what broadly could be called, called a, a code approach to, um, to signification. Richard, if you know the meaning of meaning, had read Peirce. He was one of the early readers of Peirce. And there's a book of his about the Western tradition called Beyond, in which he has a long excursus on, uh, on Peirce, and quite an expert 
discuss this at the, the beginning of the volume. But if you look at it closely, really what it takes to pass is a kind of coded version of simplification. Okay, so the discussion that he has in, in this volume called Beyond is about type and token. Okay, you may know this argument about type and token. But if you know pass, you know that the pass, we haven't got time to really discuss it, but, but pass considered type, token, and the third thing called tone. Okay, so take it from me now anyway that, that Richards has a very sort of cold version of this. His concern was that in early human communities, communication was a fairly straightforward process because there was a limited repertoire and we often knew our fellow uh, community dwellers to tell what they meant. As society becomes more atomized, okay, and that there's, there's more um, textuality to come to terms with, that becomes more and more difficult for Richardson. So, in a way, his project is a project about communication, as I said. But also, uh, he says this, he says, I mean by, uh, by learning how it works, study of the kinds of meaning that language handles, their connection with one another, there are interferences in brief, the psychology of the speech situation. So I think that he's concerned also with cognition. He's a, a kind of proto-cognitivist. But that's as far as it goes. Okay? And that's as far as I think that the responses that we got in our survey go. Um, those responses are untouched, largely by the cognitive revolution. Um, I think they're untouched by contemporary semiotics, the touch perhaps by well, an old version of semiotics, but not, not by the contemporary version that we know. So, I, I would draw attention to what those, uh, what those protestations about close reading don't do. They don't stress process. Okay? They tend to stress a gift that Close reading will produce. I can understand that because you know the, the humanities is suffering an onslaught from, um, from contemporary governments. Okay, so I can understand that we, we defend and we say, look, we've got this product. But really, you know, for, for me as a, a teacher, um, close reading should be transformative in itself, in a way. I don't mean like you know knowledge for its own sake, but but I think that the process. Um, is important, and we're working on a, a theory of that, um, that process. So, um, for example, if, if you were looking at a, a text like Hamlet, I suppose you could say that Hamlet, when you read it closely, produces something akin to empathy, or there's a lot of uh, work around at the moment that says it produces theory of mind, or replays theory of mind. But what if it was actually a process of transformation where there's a distribution of effect, there's a distribution of different feelings and passions, and those are exercised. Um, so, so we're working on a, a theory of, of that, of um, uh, uh, effect, and liberating from a, a sort of code and communication version of what um, cognition is, and certainly liberating from uh, a notion of, of divination. There's an aspect of self-realization uh, in this. You know, I, I would admit to that, not in a kind of new age way, but in a more pedagogical way. And just a, a personal thing, I, I've had no background in music. I can't read music. I've got no chance of doing it at all unless I, I work it. And I've started to learn guitar. Okay? What is the, the the purpose of me learning guitar so late in life when I've got no musical background whatsoever. Um, you know, will I learn to play a tune, twinkle twinkle little star? Or will I learn to play that? Is that the, the outcome? Or is it greater motor control that I'm looking to actually enhance as I'm getting to this age in my life? Okay, and a, a, a number of um, those attributes associated with that. Okay, so these are the kind of questions that I think that um, 
No grasping. And then another question that we're kind of developing in your theory, but we don't see these responses at all, is to do with close reading and, and the real, in, in the passing sense of the real. How can close reading bring us not to a sense of how characters are dealt with in literary criticism or how other people believe the texts work, but how can it bring us closer to an understanding of the real? Okay, the, the real in the sense of, of knowing what our ethical priorities are, knowing what our, um, what our position is in, uh, in general ecology, uh, and knowing what it is to, to be human. Cool, big ones. Thank you very much, Paul. I, I wonder whether we need special glasses to perform close reading. I do not. Okay, Daniel has a question. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. I'm not sure I want to be the first to, uh, uh, to ask a question because my question is animated by cosmic pessimism that. Uh, your part in comparison is uh, Bobby McFerry. The um, thing is, we were uh, chatting a little uh, during your uh, presentation with yeah, uh, you. Yeah, I noticed. Yeah, trying to find out what is the opposite of close reading. It's like open reading, uh, um, like far reading. Uh, but then we got to a conclusion. We got to a conclusion that the actual opposite of close reading is uh, current study programs at universities. And uh, um, I just thought that it was that it's a kind of, it's a, it was a great presentation, but it was a sad presentation that you had to come here to advocate close reading as if you know there is an alternative uh, to that. So my question is, uh, uh, along with the, with the research project that you are conducting, uh, is there a plan for promoting? Those reading to try and uh, advance the significance of it in uh, current uh, uh, academic institutions. Because the fear is that the, the trend would also lead uh, to uh, abandon not just close reading but also uh, close diagnosis in uh, medical uh, uh, research, uh, close uh, inquiry in the scientific uh, um, research, and so on and so forth. Thank you. No, absolutely. But sorry for, for interrupting you. Just uh, I just remembered something. But um, there is supposedly an alternative to close reading. I don't know if you're thinking about this. Um, you know, um, the, the literary critic called uh, Franco is narrated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to my microphone. Try to listen to my conversation. No. But I know that you're interested. Uh, so there's a literary critic called Franco Moretti, extremely, extremely uh, influential. And, and in the last few years, he's promoted distant reading, and of course that is of a piece with big data. Okay, so in a way, in, in one respect, uh, the opposite of close reading is is uh, big data, you know, or a big data approach. Uh, which uh, I'm completely suspicious of. So in a way, yes, um, this project, hopefully if we can do it across a number of uh, European universities and, and a number of areas of endeavour, we will be able to have a resurgence of close um, reading and we both promote that. But, and this is, this is the, the depressing part for me, but also the opportunity for, for people like me and you, the, the people who are currently touch, uh, teaching close reading or are willing to respond to it in the survey, they're teaching it according to, I suppose you could call it semiotics 1.0, you know, semiotics before any uh, hint of cognitivism. You know, it's a, it's a code semiotics, it's basically an early 1960s version of, of semiotics. So to, to take them with us, you know, we, we need to divest them a little bit of that, that approach. And the other thing which 
um, the reason I invoke the humanities is that a lot of the defense of the humanities, I think, is based on that same approach to, um, to course reading. I don't know if that's your experience as well, because you work quite heavily in, um, in theory of the humanities too. No? Well, would you like to uh, Yeah, yeah, do. <laughs> uh, yes, partly. Uh, I think it's a very complex uh, uh, situation. But I was mostly interested in understanding uh, if there is a way to, uh, to advance, particularly at pedagogical level, the idea of close reading as uh, a valuable uh, um, tool uh, to, uh, um, you know, to understanding and to, uh, and to the learning process. Uh, as opposed to uh, the current situation where we almost have to convince our students to, to read a couple of lines. While, uh, yeah, that's why. Yeah. Before I avoid the next question, I'll tell you very quickly, uh, Nicholas Carr in his book, The Shallow, what internet is doing to, to our brains, he, he claims that uh, actually literary studies students are not reading books. They are reading summaries in Italy. Well, thank you both. In the spirit of our conference, I appreciate it. In the spirit of our conference, would you say that those reading overlaps with the signals? If yes, how can If not, how can <laughs> Well, stay, stay. Uh, uh, I mean, you are trying to open up the pen of uh, understanding what we really need towards a base principle of understanding. Then it's semiotics. If you try to read it, semiotics for itself is this possible. This is the question. And just let me get a bit to say why, uh, where do I know about hydrogen? Along with the uh, author in their book at the end, meaning they invite that Frank Ramsey, the pupil of Wittgenstein, to have passed the letters of the first Lady Welby to Wittgenstein. This is the only indication that Wittgenstein may have heard about her. So, thank you. Okay, do just a paraphrase for those who, who uh, didn't hear. Um, the first question was, do we uh, put semiotics together with post reading? Do they overlap? And the other, the other thing, I, I would say, don't ask Ivan about it because it's a scandal. You know, if you didn't hear it, you'd be desperate to hear it about picture show. Um, but the, the first question, I think it's a bit similar to, um, to the issues that, that, that Dario brought up. And, you know, it's an, an issue that's uh, supposed to be yet. I, I think, you know, we perhaps even think about relaunching. Um, semiotics as, as close reading, you know, because more people know the, the, the term close reading. However, we would have to do it on our own terms. On one of the slides that I deleted, I had the phrase, which is from my colleague, close reading is infinite. Okay? It must be infinite and it must be an endeavor which is orientated at all times to the real. Okay, well, what we have in people's understandings of close readings now, which are sometimes, you know, very nuanced understandings, they're informed understandings by the, uh, the history of, um, of, you know, across Europe of things like hermeneutics, is a very sort of closed and limiting. I know it's for practical purposes, but it's, it's, it's much more limiting than the, the form of close reading that I think you would endorse. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Professor, thank you very much. I have to shout. Why the danger of close reading? Because you mentioned the 1929 picture, and now we are in 2017, 2018. So the notion of close is different now. Closer, closest, much closer, little closer. And in between, that time is more homogeneous faculty. Now the Muslims are coming, Asians are coming. So they have limited the closeness, so how can we control this closeness? Um, you've reminded me of something that I promised to say in this paper, right, which I, I completely forgot to say, and it's, this might seem tangential, but it's about poetry. Right? In 1929, if you read Practical Criticism, one of the things that, that Richards, and he wrote 
was concerned about was that it's not just societies getting bigger, you know, communities getting bigger, but also the proliferation of communication to the extent of information and other things, and particularly the new mass forms. You know, a lot of people were worried about, uh, about mass society, the mass forms of, um, of communication. Now, you could say, therefore, that Richard was, was right in 1929 to, to stress that the more difficult forms of communication should be the ones that we, we should focus on in order to understand um, in order to understand nuance, to, to understand depth, complexity and sophistication, and then we can be more discerning. You know, and we can, we can tell the difference between different texts and we, we can know perhaps even some value, this one's better than another. But we're not in that world anymore, as you say. We're in a world of difference. We're in a world of uh, um, heterogeneity. You know, even the most uh, homogenous societies are uh, forced to confront heterogeneity in the, in the, uh, the present uh, conjuncture. You know, we're in the world where the other is always demanding. And above all, we're in a world where there's like information overload, but there's also many, many popular texts. So what I would, would say, thinking about uh, Richards, is that that different situation means that what we perhaps are attentive to, or should be attentive to, is the nuance, complexity, and sophistication of even the most simple forms of, uh, of culture. And, and what I'm saying is nothing new, it's what we call semiotics. First, only if you allow me, I would like to ask you about the possibility of applying to your discourse uh, the idea of Wittgenstein that meaning is the use of a word. And if I understood correctly what you were saying, you were talking about a crisis of meaning because people, people, uh, are getting harder and harder uh, close to the real meaning of the word. It's not right. Okay. okay. So uh, my uh, question is, do you think that uh, we are dealing not uh, with the uh, semantical crisis, but also with the pragmatical crisis? Because people are not uh, assessing anymore the refined codes of the language? What do you think about that? Wow, well, that's a big question. I wish I knew the answer to it. The question was about are we in a, uh, not just a, a crisis of, of semantics, a crisis of meaning, but also in a uh, crisis of pragmatics. I mean, part, part of the indication is in Nicholas Carr and others who are making that, um, that critique. What can we do about the fact that people are not reading whole books? Well, one thing we, we might do is perhaps pessimistically embrace the fact that the, the age of the book was quite short and perhaps we've come to the end of it. And I would say, therefore, you know, let's focus on the semantic crisis and see what we can do to, in, in, the, in the spirit of Richard, see what we can do to, um, to enhance people's understanding of how meaning works. That part of the project, I think, the, remains intact. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, um, okay, this is working. Yeah, we have uh, Christian and we have Susan. Uh, but I wanted to ask you something. Uh, is there any <coughs> concrete, prescriptive technique, or is this more like the cultivation of an attitude and, and a sensibility in the teachers that we're teaching? That's a good question. Thank you. My other question was probably going in the same direction, but first, is, uh, when you refer to the Italian author, which is the distant learning notion, this is three reasons. You mentioned Franco-Morenzi, which is not the case because it's a good player, but it's Franco-Morenzi. Franco-Morenzi? I said it's a Morenzi. No. Okay. So, uh, my question is, okay, we have uh, 
studying this pro process only from the side of the reader. It means of the responsibility of the author as far as we are engaged obviously, in the environment planning to uh, write a book about uh, types of movement. And it's a big challenge how to write in order to release this necessity of very, very deep meaning on the side of the So do you think there is some responsibility on the side of the author to balance the yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the unspokens, I think, of people who respond to surveys on um, first reading is they, they assume that the, the producers of texts are, if not gods, they're, they're necessarily unimpeachable, if you see what I mean. They're, they're not open to, to criticism. Now, I mean, you, you can, can say, you know, with, with the whole culture, okay, we have to work with what we've got from Bono, we have to work with you know, whatever was left over when um, the library burned at Alexandria and so on. But in the present, you know, we are in a new configuration. I guess this is what you're saying. And, uh, and therefore we have to, you know, as a society, we have to work in ways which, um, which facilitate the kind of engagement that Richards was outlining in uh, close reading. Now, interestingly, uh, him and Holton trying to do that with a thing called basic English. You know, so they already had an attempt at, at this. Um, it was an attempt at internationalization. And it was based on 850 words. And of course it never got off the ground because like get Esperanto and so on. But surely there must be some other way in which we can um, we can become more aware of a society of ways to invite people to close read. So I agree. Here we have one last question. I'm not quite sure about you. Yeah. So, I think it's not. Oh, it's not terribly clear to us the difference as opposed to being between reading and close reading, reading interpretation and close reading. So that was just one question. And the other one, uh, I was wondering, uh, uh, do you know whether Ovid and Richard had any impact on the school system in England? What was the impact? Was there an impact? Did they influence education in England? Okay, so, so two questions. First question was... What was the first question? <laughs> <laughs> the difference between reading and post reading. Absolutely pertinent. I wish I could be able to put this in the paper. And then the second, reading, the second question was to the Ogden and Richards, you know, particularly through the basic English uh, exercise, were they able to have any influence on, um, on UK uh, education? Okay, so to the first, um, the first question, I have an answer that could go on for some time, but the difference between reading, okay, or whatever it is that we're, we're looking at, uh, and close reading, at first glance, you would think that, well, I'll ask, how many people have read um, The Fast and Slow Thinking by Daniel Gamzi? The popular book summarizes, thank you, summarizes a lot of Kahneman's work in psychology, but psychology in general. He has um, then this notion from a series of experiments on, on judgment in psychology. Uh, this notion of system one thinking, which is intuitive, fast thinking, um, a little bit like Percy and abduction, if you know this, you know, intuitive thinking, okay, and on the other hand, the story called system two thinking, which is more associated with logic, induction, and, um, and deduction, taking a long time to work out rationally as if you could work things out rationally with an emotional component uh, what a problem consists of. Okay? It's often assumed that close reading and you know, semiotics, for example, are exercises in system two, in logic, having a kind of slow approach as opposed to a fast and intuitive approach. Uh, for me, I don't think that that's tenable. I think that you have to have you have to have them together, as Peirce would say, you, know, you only get um, systemic logic from, uh, from abduction, you know, from things that aren't intuitive. So, I would personally, I would say that in response. 
in, in terms of Ogden and Richards, um, the basic English initiative had very little limited. No, no, I was thinking about the general. I know that basic English flock. So I think. I think in this survey it's borne out that effectively close reading as it's understood now is largely following the um, imperatives of Lincoln and Richards. And it's very much a 1920s thing. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very short. Can you do it very short? The congratulations of the choice in the beginning of Iowa and from Richards because is this his triad with Ogden? Yes, it was so mad that we have the side and we have the meaning towards which uh, we strive in communication, we have reference. And there is the detachment of sign from the reference. And then people, in fact, know the reality in a different way. So there, there is misunderstanding and differences among people. And similarities, they strive through. Okay, I think we're ready for close eating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we take, uh, <laughs>